First of all, I want to thank you. I want to thank the, the foundation for uh, inviting me, and especially for uh, for accommodating my specific uh, uh, special needs, uh, both in terms of timing and in terms of of, of keeping me well fed while I'm still kosher. So I thank you. For that. <laughs> and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, I can. I don't know if I can make up time, but hopefully, I won't send us further behind. We're in New York, so I can talk really fast now, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. My wife, when we first got here, uh, we get out, of Penn, get out of the train Penn Station, and my New York like, switch goes on. She's like, slow down. You're not in a hurry. <laughs> so I grew, up, I grew up around here. So what we're going to talk about is the role of rehab, and, and uh, hopefully we'll define some things, too, so you'll understand what the, the breadth and scope of rehab is. And uh, my goal is to make you an educated consumer. There was a great clothing store that doesn't exist anymore that started actually out here on Long Island called Sims, and their motto was, an educated consumer is our best customer. And I think it's important that you guys be educated consumers of medical care. In fact, uh, Charles and I were talking, I think that, you, that one thing you have to be is a good advocate, and well, maybe that'll come into this a little bit. So this is what I am, I'm a physiatrist. A physiatrist or you say physiatrist, whichever way you like. I like physiatrists because you say physiatrists, most people either want to tell you about their crazy camp in the basement, or take, have you take a look at their toenails. They think you know, they're a podiatrist or psychiatrist. But anyhow, that means I'm a, a specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation. It means we're the docs who, the non-operative, non-surgical docs who focus on care of people who have disability or pain. And we know we really hit the big time when we got into Dean's day. So this is actually a cartoon version of Jeff Gamble, a real Army physiatrist from Walter Reed, back from the old up Walter Reed, where Gary Trudeau <coughs> and they sat in the drawing people. So we are tend we, did, we did, do tend to be misunderstood. I mean, people don't know us, physiatrists or physiatrists, however you say it doesn't really roll off the tongue. But uh, if you think of rehab as being a symphony orchestra, a symphony orchestra needs a conductor. The conductor is only as good as his or her relationship with the excellent musicians, which would be the various other members of the rehab team. But if you want everybody to play together and in the same time signature and in tune, and something as complicated as a, as a, as a disability, you <coughs> have somebody who's just going to focus on that. We can talk doctor to the other doctors, and can talk rehab to the, to the, to the, the rehab specialist, and can talk English to the patient. Unless they only speak Spanish or something else, then you should use that language. So what I'm going to try to accomplish in this talk is the following thing. So I want to talk about our understanding of how, how both M primarily fibrous displays, but also even the endocrine aspects of, of MAS do affect the abilities and performance, and talk about the strategies that we can try to do to optimize that performance, and mostly try to answer questions. Now, this is an important caveat, and you'll see throughout the lecture, CYLP, consult your local medical and rehabilitation professionals. So what I'm telling you is general suggestions don't go off and just do it by yourself. Make sure you talk to good professionals, but also make sure that they talk to you. Because it is your health or your, or your child or your spouse's or your, 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 your parents' health. So you're the advocate and that they have to be able to work with you and try to understand you. But you do need their professional eyes and hands to help you along that, that journey. So let me tell you stuff you already know because that way you know I know it too. So what? The, first of all, I want to use some famous rehab terminology and get used to that. So mostly what you hear people talk about is diseases. Diseases are, 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 are medical conditions. Medical conditions cause impairments. So lack of mobility in your wrist would be an impairment. So we'll talk about impairments. I'll get to something called disabilities later. And handicap is something totally different. So malalignment. So you have problems with the with with uh, bowing or angles and joints in, in, because you have a bone disease. You could actually have total deformities. The famous shepherd's crook, when the, the the top of the the top of the hip bone instead of being a nice angle now is all curved like the crook of of uh, Mary. I think of Mary had a little lamb which she would walk around with. It's okay for sheep. Shepherding, but it's not good for walking. Leg length discrepancy. This is something that happens in a bone disease where it can be on one side, not the other, or on one side, more than the other. And 
nothing new to tell you that there's fractures. Now, there's secondary impairments, things that happen because of the primary impairments. Pain. I mean, I, I'm sorry I didn't get to hear the whole thing. I was I the thing. But uh, pain, obviously, is a very big, a th a big issue. And we've had a number of lectures on pain. And weakness. <coughs> and these things are not independent. They play into each other. And loss of range of motion. That you don't start with a loss of range of motion. That's only when things, other things happen to the bone or the joints or your activity. And then deconditioning is a loss of energy and fatigue. This is now either because you actually have weak muscles or you have loss of mobility, you then lose endurance. And now you can't, uh, you could walk five blocks in New York, now you, you get tired or, or you have pain after walking only one. So I, I also want to say that, that uh, because I didn't refer it directly, if you think of some of the endocrine challenges that you can have, and if you, if you remember Dr. Poise's lecture from yesterday, a lot of those can result in fatigue. So, and, and especially if you were to have the more rare a Cushing's disorder, Cushing's disorder can actually literally make your muscles weaker. So you can have, from the endocrine issues, effect <coughs> on, on energy level and on muscle, and now you have sort of a double dose of challenge. So these are functional abilities. When you don't, when you can't do a functional ability or you have a, a, a limitation in it, then it's called a disability. So an impairment in something that your body is supposed to do can lead to a disability and can impair things that we want to do on a daily basis just to live, walking and getting around, doing the things we need to do when we first wake up in the morning and throughout the day just to get to the stuff we want to do. And then the higher level activities of daily living that we have a need to do to pay the bills or to keep the house from getting dirty. And then those things that we want to do, well, in terms of recreation and interpersonal relationships. So what does rehab do? How can we help in this situation? So the most important thing, if this is, if this is the only slide you get, then this is the slide to get because this is to explain to you the philosophy of how we approach things. And you can apply that philosophy, and you can help your doctors, even for the person who's in West Elbow, Texas, where the closest physiatrist is, you know, 300 miles away, and the PTs are used to doing back pain and nothing else, and the closest orthopedist is 100 miles away, and he's, he focuses on doing stuff that doesn't have anything to do with uh, with, with, uh, with fibrous dysplasia. So he, applying these principles is what really is what's important. So first thing first is know, it's helpful to know the medical condition and identify what impairments that condition causes. But truth be, be told, even when we don't know what the medical condition is, if we know what the impairments are, if we know what these things are, how it's affecting the body, how it affects the heart and lungs, how it affects the muscles, the joints, uh, the nervous system, then you can come up with a plan to try to intervene. We have a program at the NIH called the Undiagnosed Diseases Program. And so most people don't know what they have. And we don't know what they have. And even the results of figuring out what they do have is maybe you know two in 10 people that figure out what, what it is, what some strange genetic, genetic problem it is. But we can still identify <laughs> what organ systems are affected, and how they're affected. If you know how they're affected, you can try to minimize that effect. If you have a weak muscle, you can try to get it stronger. If you have a joint that is tight, and there's no, and there's, the joint itself is still healthy enough that a stretch won't hurt it, you can try to stretch it out. And then sometimes you can't change the impairment. You can't it prevent it, even minimizing it, so you're still left with a disability. So this is the next step, you compensate for disabilities. If, if, if there's a famous you know, saying that uh, if it's not broken, don't fix it, some, you have to recognize sometimes even when it, when it is broken, you can't fix it, but that doesn't mean you can't compensate for that and still get a good quality of life. Somebody who, who, whose uh, pain or joint limitations or any other condition limits them from getting around 
more than say from one end of the to the, to the, to the, of the room to the other on two feet, but can wheel around and still have a perfectly great life wheeling around. And that's good. That's a lot better than sitting in the room because all you can do is walk from one end to the other. And how do we try to do this? So what I get, when I, when I feel a little bit devilish and I, I want to give uh, residents a hard time or even smart out of medical students a hard time, I'll ask them the following question, and that is for them to give me the normal range of values for the blood rehab type. And the smart ones will figure out right away is there's no such thing as a blood rehab level. You can't measure your rehab functional level and say, oh, rehab's working, like you could take a urine sample and say, oh, the antibiotic has killed off your, your, your urine. Okay. All we can do is start to say, based on what your constellation of impairments are, what we think would be reasonable, realistic, and safe to try to accomplish <coughs> for the long term, and what are the steps going to be to get there. And then, every step of the way, we go back and see, did we get there or not? and do we need to reassess the program? And then the reason it's physical medicine and rehab for our specialty is because, or physiatry is because physics was where it's at for us. We're using various types of physical modalities to try to impact on those areas. That's exercise, heat, cold, electricity, uh, and, try, and, and, and engineering and equipment to try to optimize your function. So one thing that I think that any person with a bone disease, and certainly with fibrous dysplasia, and some of our patients have, have, have validated this very strongly for me, is water is where you need to be. Because water is buoyant, so it supports you if you're weak. Water absorbs shock. So if you have pain or you have bone that would, it would take, the, if it took the shock of impact on the ground, that wouldn't necessarily be so good. And you have to know that here's an interesting physics point. When one leg is on the ground and you're walking and the other one's off the ground, there is approximately two and a half times your body weight of force going through your leg. Because you push down on the ground, the ground pushes back on you, and people who like vector vector calculus will understand that the angle is such, so when you resolve the vector, I like math a little bit, uh, <laughs> it's actually more than two and a half, more than two times, it's an extra half a time to where the force is going through. So you're putting a lot of force through your body. If you're in the water, you're not putting that foot force in the water through your body. It, it's being, the water is absorbing the shock. Warm water, especially for most people, helps relieve pain. So how can you advance to get stronger or looser if you're in pain, but if you're in the water in a nice warm pool, maybe you can go further. And by the way, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to, if you have no pool within, you know, your poor person in West Elbow, Texas again, you know, so the, the closest, you know, public pool is is, uh, is 500 miles away in in, in, uh, in Dallas. Uh, and they, they asked the, the, the hotel that's 25 miles away that has a pool that no one ever uses, whether they could use it, and they said no. So especially if, if you're on the smaller side, you can get a hot tub. And you can do a lot just standing in a hot tub. But at the same time, the water resists your movement. So the water is a kind of weight training in a way, because you have to push against a uh, force. And that's why I sort of alluded to it. It's not just if you can swim, that's great. Swimming can do some wonderful things. But standing upright in the water can, can work. And again, warm is better. And this can help with all those things that I referred to, referred to already. And see, I thought of it even before. <laughs> Hot tubs, great for kids. And even a regular pool, a regular tub. Your tub in your house. If you have a small child, you can do a lot of stuff in the water in the tub in the house. OK, so leg leg discrepancy. What does this do? And what can you maybe, what, what do you want to think to do about it? So if one leg is longer than another, when you measure it laying down or you measure for an x-ray, well, that's interesting. But it's interesting. What's, what's important is what's going on when you're standing up. 
if you're standing up uh, uh, for my lecture on uh, on on scoliosis it, it, that I give to residents, I needed a picture of of somebody with scoliosis just looking from the back. So I took my now almost 21 year old, and he was about nine or ten, and I made him take one shoe off and keep one shoe on, and we took a picture of his back. And lo and behold, he had scoliosis because one one leg was now longer than the other, so he went like that. And so. The pelvis is kind of where your body gets level. And granted, when we walk, our pelvis moves back and forth. But we mostly want to stay level. If you have one leg lower than the other, your pelvis is off kilter. Now, that affects your spine. That can hurt. And that certainly isn't going to be good for walking. And the way the forces are going to go through each of your legs and how the muscles are going to work is not going to be symmetric. That certainly can be a source of pain. So if you're going to deal with leg-leg discrepancy, I think you have to think about it from that standpoint. You also have to consider that, that other things can happen. If people have very loose rubber band tissues, ligaments, and tendons, so they can have a leg, which, and if it's loose on one side and not the other, the leg can kind of be in like that, the foot can be flat, and that can actually shorten that side functionally, even though if you measure the legs, they're both the same length. So what do you do? We want to keep the pelvis standing still level and see how that affects people's walking. So you can modify a shoe to improve the symmetry of your pelvis and take some of that asymmetric force off your body, and that would be a would be shoe modifications, types of lifts and things. Again, you the best way to do this is have a good rehab team and have somebody who knows what they're doing prescribe the lift after figuring out how much that is and then make sure it was made the right way. We have a series of boards that we use, and a lot of physiatrists and orthopedists will have these boards that are graded by, say, an eighth of an inch, or people will do it by maybe a, a quarter of a centimeter if they're, if they're so inclined. Uh, but if you're somewhere where that doesn't exist, most doctors have really thick medical books. And all you have to do is get one of those medical books on the ground, open it to how many pages it takes for that pelvis to be level, and then if the doctor doesn't have a tape measure in their office, not a good sign. They should have a tape measure in their office. They can now take a tape measure and measure how many pages of Schwartz's general surgery book or Delissa's orthopedics or, or Rockwood and Green's uh, you know, orthopedic book they needed to make the, 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 the person level. That's how much lift you need. So where do you put it? On the level of nose, like I said. You could put about three eighths of an inch into a shoe. If it's a regular deep, standard depth shoe. If, first of all, if it's, a, if it's a Chuck Taylor or, or like Ken's boat shoe, you shouldn't even wear it. Does. I don't want to talk to you about that. I don't want to talk about that. <coughs> Structure choosing is important for support. And I, I'll mention a little bit about that. But the key is, if you go over three eighths of an inch, now your heel is out of the shoe. You're no longer in the shoe. So that's as much as you can get away with inside the shoe. Beyond that, you have to go outside the shoe. So if you have a flat-footed thing, now your foot's bending where it's not supposed to. You've lost the spring. The whole point, well, I shouldn't say the whole point. One of the important points of having an arch in your foot is when you land, it's a spring. It's a shock absorber. If you don't have that shock absorber, then the forces are going through your foot and your leg and your hip into your pelvis in a way that's not going to be comfortable. So if you can replace that arch by having a, a properly made orth orthotic system, that's good too. Now, if your foot is flexible, in other words, when you're not putting weight on it, you can make it look like a regular foot. And someone says, well, just step on this, step, put, step your foot into this box and we'll make an orthotic for you. I say, no, thank you. Because what, what foot just stepped in the box? Anybody know what foot stepped in that box? Whose foot stepped that box? Your flat foot just stepped in that box. What are they making a mold of? Your flat foot. Who did that help? It helped uh, the guy who made it because maybe he made a payment on his kids college bill. Not going to help you very much. So it has to be supervised by somebody who knows what they're doing. And also, we prefer it made out of something that's flexible but it has some compression to it like a foam or a cork or something. The really, really hard plastic ones that, that 
seem to be popular with a lot of podiatrists. So now you just put this hard, I've got a hard piece of plastic on your foot, and you're coming down with two and a half times your body weight on your foot, onto this really hard piece of plastic. It doesn't spring. I don't think that's such a good idea. And the shoe needs to have structure to support this whole system. So the shoe, if it's weaky, 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 you pick it up, you can twist it in every which way, you push it in the back area, <laughs> and it's like softer than anything. And if and the out part where the heel is is narrower than the part where your foot is, you're now wobbly unstable and having no support. So structured shoes are a good idea. Cute shoes are okay for maybe 80 per 80% of the time in the structured shoes, but but, but a certain person in the front row is lecturing today. And she wants to look cute. And I endorse that. I endorse that. I endorse, that. I endorse cute shoes, but, not, but, but they shouldn't be your, 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 your workhorse shoe. Your workhorse shoe should, should be well structured. We know my workhorse shoe. We know about that. What is it? In, in the, something in heels? What's the book? Unstoppable. Unstoppable in heels. So she does. Stilettos. Stilettos. Yeah, she gets special dispensation. She's <laughs> homeless, so she gets extra special dispensation. So, so then you have to do the heels too, right? <laughs> but uh, more than three eighths of an inch has to be outside the shoe. But now, if it's outside the shoe, something else has to be right. Take a look at your shoes and tell me what you notice on the top of your shoes in the area towards your toes in front of the laces. What do you, what do you notice in your shoes? that wasn't there when you got them out of the box? Crease. A crease. Mm. Why is that crease there? Anybody know? Because, yeah, toe off. Very good. Somebody knows uh, gait cycle. Uh, because you bend your toes. So if you put a really thick piece of uh, lift in, which you may need because you want to be level, you don't want to be uncomfortable, and it's just a flat, they just like laid something on it, and it's as thick in the, fr in the front as it was in the back, now you can't do toe off. Your, your foot can't roll. And now you change the way you're walking. You may now create a new pain that you didn't have before. So it's very important that it be have what, what's called a rocker or a toe roll. <laughs> that in front of the ball of the foot, it's contoured up. So since it, you can't bend your toes because it's too thick, that the, the shoe bends for you. Without that, you're messing with the walking, and that's not going to happen. So, uh, this is, there's the people who make shoe orthoses and do shoe modifications who actually have an understanding of, <coughs> of the biomechanics of gait are called pet orthists. And they're certified under the same certifying body as orthotists who make ankle foot and knee, ankle foot orthoses and prosthetic makers. And those are the people who you need to work with, your, your, your rehab team, your physician needs to work with to uh, Make, have it made well. It's usually not going to be a shoemaker because they're not going to understand the, these intricacies. Sometimes you can get lucky. And all there is is a shoemaker, and the shoemaker is willing to listen and work with the rehab professionals. That's better than not getting your lift. So what about all the things that we know a lot of that, that happens often in the ass and fibrous dysplasia? Fibrous dysplasia can cause malalignment on its own. We do see, and I'm not sure if we can describe what this subgroup is, but there are a lot of people, it just may be a true true and unrelated, who have fibrous dysplasia and also have uh, joint laxity. They, their ligaments and tendons are loose. So how do you control laxity? Well, you cannot like crank the, muscle, the, the ligaments tighter or the tendons tighter. And I think even if, if, even if one of our wonderful surgeons uh, cut a piece out and tighten it up temporarily because the underlying physiology of that rubber band tissue is such that it's going to get loose again, I think that it wouldn't really help. So it's like you have a loose, you have a good motor and you have a loose fan belt. So you can't really change, you can't tighten the fan belts here. So what you got to do is strengthen the motors. And you can also, the other thing before I get to bracing, the other thing you could do is you can actually uh, train the, the reaction time of those motors to be better. So they know, so your body subconsciously knows, even though you have this lag time between when brain says go, and the, the, that little lag in the in the, lick, in, in the rubber bands is passed, so the muscles can turn on. You can teach the muscles to be a little bit faster in reaction time to compensate for that. You can wear some different types of braces. 
uh, to align things that compensate if necessary. And this may then help with malalignment because, as I said, if you have a flat foot and you loose ligaments, you may end up getting knock knee. If you get knock knee, that's going to cause other problems as, as the forces go through your body, and that's not desirable. So what about the bony deformities themselves? So likely the most the biggest problem is one that is going to be more in Dr. Collins and Dr. Roby's camp, and that is what we can do with the thyroid display for themselves because they affect the geometry of the bone. <coughs> and they don't take stress and weight-bearing well. But if we can change the weight-bearing in order to relieve at least even out the stresses on the bone, maybe we can at least slow, if not prevent, some of the, the bad deformities that we see. So sometimes you need to take the weight off of it. And that would be what a cane or a walker would do. Sometimes you just need to get the force in the right direction. That's what a brace can sometimes do. And for sure, if one leg's longer than the other, you keep on pounding on them, them differently, that's going to put asymmetric forces on, on bone that has, for lack of a better word, soft areas. So if you even that out, now you've evened out the stresses, the forces that go on those, those two legs. And then strength in bone. We know from arthritis and lots of other bone-related diseases, if the bone is, is, is having pain, if the bone is, is if the cartilage is not, a, is not there and not absorbing the shock in a joint, at a at very least, you can have the muscles stronger, so they're taking more of what's going of, of the force. They're taking more of what's happening in order to uh, to take, a, take some of the stress off of the bone. What about joint mobility? Of course, why is there a lack of joint mobility? This is where you have to do a good exam, look at a proper imaging studies, x-rays, and things like that. Is it, are the bone structures such that that joint is just not going to move the way you want it to? Well, that stinks, but that's not something that you're going to likely change with a non-operative approach. But if just the opposite of the loose rubber bands, you have super tight rubber bands, you can loosen them up. And that's going to have a different, uh, like I said, bony restrictions, then you go to, uh, you go to the, the, the smart orthopedist who understands this condition and, and discuss whether or not there's some remedy for it, or are we going to go into the whole world of compensation as opposed to reducing disinterference. But if you do range of motion properly, you can restore, restore mobility and then restore symmetry and work on strength, and that can help reduce pain and increase function. What about fractures? I'm going to say some things that really make it important you have to talk to your local practitioners before you just run off and do this. But first of all, prevent them. What I keep on saying, I'm a broken record. Keep the body balanced. Keep the muscles as strong as they can to support the, the bones that may not be able to take it that well. Reduce the impact of the fracture as follows. Work with your orthopedist if you've had that fracture repaired in one way or another and get up and moving as soon as they deem it safe. Because the longer you're not moving, the tighter things get, the weaker things get, and the longer the rehab's going to be, and the, the, the greater the chance of not getting back to where you were. And even if that area has to be protected and baby for a little while, what about the other leg? What about the back? What are you doing to prevent everything else from getting weak so that when you are clear to start taking some weight on the side that they have had to repair, the weight on the other, the other side of the body can support a little bit more weight for a while and push you on that rehab. But that's really, you can't get tight in the other places, you can't get weak in the other places, because if you do, you've now done two steps back for the one step forward of the repair that was done. What do you do about muscle weakness? So it could be because of the things we just talked about. So find, I guess the, the important thing is, that, and, and if you're going to see one of my colleagues, you have to make sure they're going to sit with you and ask you what you do, how are you doing, the everyday activities that you're doing. What I do is I, I, I walk a person through a typical day and think about the details of that typical day. Do you have trouble just getting in and out of bed? Do you have trouble standing up? Is there a problem when you have to walk to go to the bathroom in the morning? Do you have trouble getting up and down off the toilet seat? 
get in and out of the tub. Can you balance on one leg so you can wash the other one? You think about all the details of what we have to do on a daily basis. And those details, your physiatrist should be asking about every single single one of them in order to figure out what's going on. Also, they have to know who you are. Otherwise, it's going to be like the famous joke about the guy who goes to the orthopedist and gets his cast off after fracturing his wrist. And the doctor, and he says, hey, doc, can I play violin? He says, sure, you can play violin. Your arm's as good as new. He says, well, that's great, because I never played before. <laughs> so it has to be focused on who you are. Making goals that are irrelevant to you is not helping anybody. So understand what's, what's they have to understand the you in terms of the you in function, everyday function. And that includes the pain things that Dr. Handel talked about yesterday. And that means knowing when you hurt, what causes pain, what makes it feel better, uh, what time of day, what movements, all those things are going to go into figuring out how you can be able to do more than more of what you want to do. Because the point is to have to help you have the, the, the best possible quality of life given the challenges you're faced with. So strength exercises have to be careful. You don't go to the gym, put three 45-pound plates on either side of a barbell weight, and start pressing mega bits of, of, of iron if you've never done that before. Especially if you have to have a big honking virus dysplasia in your humerus. It's called the humerus, but that's not a funny thing to do. Okay, so, so you have to do this carefully, gradually, thoughtfully with people who can advise you so you don't end up causing more problems, but you do get good results. And that's why, again, we get back to water. We all evolved out of the water, and the water is a good place. So to do strengthening, though, it's not just, you know, I, I go to the gym in the morning because if I don't go in the morning, I'll never get there. And, because if I don't go to the gym, how can I tell people to work out? It'd be like the pulmonologist who smoke and tell their doctor, their patients that they have to stop smoking. So I see like this one guy who, who looks like he's pregnant, and, it, and it's looked like that for the last five years. And he comes up after doing like a little bit of this on the elliptical for like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and he, he uses like one plate on all the machines and goes boom, 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 gazillions of times. I don't think he's any stronger than he was when he started. So the key is you have to have a sustained contraction. The muscle has to work. It has to be against a force that's safe for you. And there's three ways it can be done. It can be a force where you're just pushing and nothing's moving. That's called isometric. Metric is length. It's not moving. And if that's what you can do, that's OK. But it should be a contraction. Isotonic is what most of us do when we're on a, on a weight machine or free weights. It's, 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 the, the, your, it's a steady muscle contraction. You know, you're moving with the same force, but not the same speed necessarily. You may be in acceleration when you're doing that. The fanciest one is called isokinetic. That's really for specific, specific reasons that you don't need to do. Those are those machines where it has a motor that means you can only move at one speed, but you can put different amounts of force during that speed. I just mentioned it so I didn't leave anything out. But the point is that it has to be a contraction. The muscle has to work. Otherwise, there's no signal for the muscle to try to get stronger. And this is what I said already. You really have to be careful. If you have a bone disorder, you don't want to break the bone, trying to get the muscle stronger to support the bone. It has to be done in a careful, measured way. You need people to help advise you. Deconditioning. So we have decreased endurance. You're not active. And now you're like the penny going down the, the, the well in the mall. It's just, it, any of these things can make you weaker, then you don't move around, you lose endurance, then you're tired, you're fatigued, you have pain, you move less, and it's all the way down. So the, the key is to move from a vicious cycle to a virtual, virtuous cycle, and that means you have to st slowly break it by, by gradually increasing what you're doing and focusing first on aerobic exercise, meaning things that, that, that address endurance, because it's a lot more important that you can walk a block, a wheel a block, without losing breath, than if you can you know, lift uh, 25 pounds on a biceps curve. Mm -hmm. So aerobic exercise is something that gets your heart rate up. That's how you know it's working. And it's, a way, it's also good for your heart and lungs. And we're all hope, hopefully continuing to get older. And that means you need to uh, 
to, <coughs> to keep your heart and lung alive. Again, I like water, swimming, water aerobics, other things that, are, that can be good is walking, wheeling, cycling, because it's low impact, scooting. Even if, you, if all you can do on your own is the scooter roll on the floor, that's still an exercise. If it gets your heart going, do it. And, and there's some thought that maybe if you have lung challenges, playing a wind instrument might help. If the people in your house don't mind it. <laughs> yeah, pain. I'm going to go through this quickly because I think everybody else has spoken a lot about this. Uh, but focus on the cause. Warm and cold can help. TENS was discussed yesterday. Massage, relaxation techniques. Pain is something that you can, that can control you or you can under control, even if you can't make it go away. Acupuncture, I don't have to discuss that. Sorry. Local injection sometimes can help. So let's talk about, uh, how much time do I have? You're done. <laughs> 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 Did you like about too much? Uh, I think you were, well, you're cutting into a new break. Uh, but, well, it's up uh, to them. We'll, uh, we'll say five. Okay, we can talk to you along. Because other people who meet with doctors can go and okay. you know, cut so, into so the So this is, so that, that's the impairment. So let's talk about what you do if you can't fix it. If it is broken, you can't fix it to have a good quality of life. First of all, if you get tired of doing things, there's ways of doing things that are more efficient. Sit rather than stand when you get dressed. Keep things close together. Plan what you're going to do and the steps of what you need to do. And have it all planned out so like you're not getting up in the morning, going to the closet, taking out your pants, going back to the closet, taking out your shirt, then going to the first, take out your underwear, then going back to get your sock. Get it all at once, put it next to your bed, sit down, put it all on. Physics should be your friend. Slide things when you can instead of lifting them. Use good body mechanics. And use, put things at the right height. Use equipment that can help you. Walking. So we talked a little bit about orthoses and assistive devices. And here's the, this is the thing that's new from this lecture from last time, is we've actually been able to show with correlation. Correlation doesn't, uh, doesn't prove causation, but we have been able to show by looking at the, his, at, at the records of our patients who have been nice enough to, to come to NIH and allow us to do muscle testing and walking tests and all that, that Strength and range of motion has a pop, having more strength and more mobility in feet has a good, seems to have a good impact on your efficiency of walking, your ability to walk faster, farther in the same amount of time. And it seems that the hip is the place to go. Most importantly, fixing leg length is the way to go for making, and the results seem to be better if you start when you're younger. So if you start when you're younger to keep especially the hip, the whole body, but especially the hip, strong and flexible, and make sure that the legs are level, then you're more likely to keep on walking with longer and, and with less pain and better efficiency. And that makes it probably easier. What can you do? You did all sorts of different canes. Many of you have seen these. There are canes with wheels, as well as we have walkers. There are crutches of different types. Some go under your armpits, some go under your forearms. You, if you have a problem with a, with, with, a, with a fracture or something going on in your your arm so that you can't take weight down like that, you can put your uh, arm on a platform and still have the that support. There's different types of walkers. One thing to consider is a walker that has wheels and a seat. Because if you get tired, you can sit down and then you can get up again. Some, this is rarely used, but there's a one for one foot. Okay, the advantages of, of, of pushing versus, uh, versus electricity and going around, you get manuals are lighter and you're getting some exercise. If you can do it, but you can't do it that well, you can put assist wheels on, electric assist wheels on your chair, and still be able to push, but you have some help going up hills. And then if you need power, that's okay. And it gives you some ability to, to have some adjustability as well. And then if you can't reach your back, get a sponge on a stick. If you can't safely stand, get a chair to sit on. If you're having trouble getting in and out of the, of the, of the tub, grab onto something, but have it put on properly. The, stuff, the ones with the, with the suction cups are probably kind of good idea. <laughs> Toileting. If you, if you can't get up from a toilet, get one with arms. Get it a little bit higher so it's not as much work. And if you have trouble because of limitation of the range of motion and reaching your own butt to wipe yourself, there are aids for that. So you don't have to feel helpless and needing someone else. Dressing. There are, those things are different types of, of button hookers. You have trouble buttoning things. That's for pulling up zippers. 
That's for getting on your sock. That's for getting on your sock. That's for getting your shoe in. It's a shoehorn. Elastic laces. You only have to tie your shoes once. And what my wife used to call a long-handled nurse pincher when she was the bird therapist in Baltimore City Hospital. But it's useful for more than just pinching nurses. It's also different for people off the ground. Uh, you know what that is? That gets the toothpaste out of the tube. That's another way to get out of the tube. You can hold it easier that way. You can reach up and brush your hair by yourself. You can mount your hair dryer so you don't have to hold it. You can grab onto, you can have easier cups. That's the, this one will open up your jars better, and you can cut things if you can only hold with one hand. You know what that is? That's a handy dandy thing. It'll open a flip top, it'll open a can, it'll open a package. And that's another way to open jars. And there's things to get it so you can use in the home as well and things for work that will help as well. And don't forget, there's things you can use for things that are fun too. Life should have some fun in it. There's adaptive equipment for all these sorts of things, and there are even adaptive sports leagues. So I guess I don't have time for questions right now because we're falling behind, but I'll be available as needed. Yeah,